So today we're going to talk a little bit about air pollution and some of the effects that it has, its environmental effects. Um, air pollution and water pollution being sort of two of our major categories when we're, uh, when we're studying environmental science and when we're looking for things to clean up through environmental engineering. So there are many sources of air pollution. Uh, many of these sources are what we call anthropogenic, which means that they're generated by the activities of man, but not all of them are. A number of the sources can include just the normal sort of physical and chemical processes that occur uh, naturally, either from natural biology or from the activity of things like volcanoes or the chemical processes, the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere, for example, can cause a lot of chemical changes in the environment. Um, but again, the majority of things that we're concerned about are things that are anthropogenic. In other words, man-made um, man -made pollutants. Um, and generally, those pollutants will be created in one location, then they will be transported through the motion of the air and end up somewhere else. So there is actually a cycle for these pollutants in the same way that there is a water cycle um, or a carbon cycle. There are sort of cycles for pollutants, how they enter the atmosphere and then how they are in other sort of conditions in the water system or even in the soil, etc. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different types. Here are some of the primary types of air pollutants um, and their different a list of their different sources. Again, you'll see many of these. Their sources are things like industry and another big source is vehicles. Our use of automobiles um, contributes as major sources. So vehicles being some of the major sources here. And as we continue to increase our use of vehicles that burn fossil fuels, we tend to continue to contribute to air pollution. All of these have different sort of health effects as well as effects on the natural environment. So we're concerned both with their effects on humans and their effects on um, other aspects of the environment. So let's talk first of all about a term called smog. Smog is kind of a mix, well it is a mix of the two terms smoke and fog, where smoke is particulate matter, uh, soot and soil and ash and other things that are created usually by human activity. Okay, and fog is the natural sort of um, accumulation of water in the atmosphere when it gets saturated. And basically, once you've created smog, you will have the combination of water mixed in with various chemicals, which will sort of increase chemical reactions, and that either creates additional particles or makes the particles that currently exist in the smoke, it changes their, their chemistry. So when we talk about particles, it's sort of the first thing we talk about air pollution, are very, very small, fine particles of, well, what are actually solid. They're not actually gaseous form, they're solid, but they're light enough and small enough that if they get kicked up or stirred up or pushed into the atmosphere, then they'll actually stay in the atmosphere for a period in time. Uh, they are usually heavier than air, which means that they'll usually eventually uh, over time settle out, but lots of activity in the air, lots of stirring or mixing can kick them back up into the um, into the atmosphere again. The particles can be harmful themselves. You don't want chunks of dirt in your lungs and in fact your body is sort of designed to prevent some particles from getting in there uh, through your the mucous membranes in your nose and in your throat etc. Um, but large amounts of them can be harmful in themselves but in addition these particles also tend to harbor places where chemicals can attach to and then those chemicals get delivered into the lungs and into the body. Uh, also, biological pathogens can sometimes be attached to particles, although this is less frequent when we're talking about air pollution. Now, there's a, a concept here called an inversion. It turns out that the layers of the atmosphere, the atmosphere itself, can sort of be separated into layers, uh, four different layers, and these layers are primarily based on differences in temperature. Well, actually, differences in how the temperature is changing. For our lowest layer in the troposphere, you actually have a cooling effect. You notice if you climb a mountain or the higher you go, the cooler you get. The further you get away from the earth, which is a heating source, um, and things cool down. But once you get to a certain point, you get to an area in the atmosphere where some of the air is being heated up by the interaction of light with particles there, including things like uh, carbon dioxide, etc. And that leads to a heating effect in that area, which means that there is a layer where we go from gradually cooling to gradually heating. Uh, that's the stratosphere. 
And what happens there is in between there, in that area of cooling, that sort of warmer air that's above the colder air prevents some of the motion, the vertical motion, or changes how things are moving, prevents some of the vertical motion that would normally occur with less density um, as, you, as things would rise. So it tends to trap atmospheric particles, trapping air and atmospheric particles underneath it. Well, that inversion, those will change depending on sort of your weather, the, uh, depending on the weather in the area. The inversion may be higher or lower, okay? And so as you can see, like the winter sun supplies a little less, war little less warmth. The warm air kind of caps things in, okay? And you tend to trap pollutants inside. And those pollutants can be further trapped by the existence of things like mountains. So just the sort of physical and temperature nature of the atmosphere can sort of create a container um, uh, and or sort of areas to hold pollutants in. And they can also create areas that end up guiding the pollutants that they're pushed in certain directions by the motion of the wind. So some of the different types of uh, compounds we might be considered on. First of all, sulfur compounds. Now, sulfur exists naturally. It is something that's emitted by things like volcanoes. But generally, it's something that is a result of combustion. And when we combust fossil fuels, um, both for industry and for vehicles, we create um, part of the remnants that are left behind are things like sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, basically sulfur mixed with oxygen, um, and different sort of particular matter. Okay, well, when that, those sulfates actually interact with hydrogen and oxygen, there's a tendency for things to break under different energy and leave relatively acidic conditions as a result. Um, so sulfur is a pretty big contributor to things like um, acid rain. You'll notice here that there's sort of a, a number of, a list here of different air pollution that comes from power plants, of which sulfur dioxide, 60% of it comes from the power plants. So some of the effects of things like sulfur um, in humans, it basically affects respiration to some degree. Um, and it's also been sort of connected to things like cancer and heart disease. In the environment, it affects it's these pictures here of something uh, of acid rain. As we've talked about, it'll change. It'll sort of acidify uh, the water as it falls from the sky, okay, which then inhibits aquatic species and also has effects on forests if they're if they're subjected to significant amounts. So in this case, it's sort of a connection between uh, air quality and water quality. Some of the ways that we can handle that is that we can require uh, processes, chemical processes, that before we vent out um, the waste products, the air, waste air products from burning things, we can actually use what are called scrubbers. We have different technologies that will allow us to sort of mix in um, in this case, there's things like a limestone slurry. Basically, that's a mixture of lime and water that sort of, as it falls through, it kind of mixes and gives the uh, sulfur compounds an opportunity to, to react before they're released into the main chimney stack and then into the atmosphere. So we have methods of sort of cleaning things out, and then we end up with different solid products that can either be used or disposed of uh, in a different fashion. There are other sort of technologies that we uh, can use to do this. We can filter using uh, actual physical bags to sort of filter through things and capture things. And there are also other ways that we can use sort of electricity and electrostatics to take advantage of the fact that sulfates tend to have charges and will interact to remove um, the sulfates from the, from the environment. Okay. One of the things you'll actually notice is there have been some rules that have been passed to change the amount of sulfur before you burn the fuel, that you actually do some things in the processing that remove some of the sulfur from the fuels, and that has been very helpful in reducing sulfur content in the atmosphere, as you can see um, over time here. Actually, I believe that's a plot of the um, restrictions on fuels. So another one, nitrogen. Nitrogen is actually sort of key um, in, is another key sort of uh, environmental pollutant, primarily because it's an available nutrient. So it actually changes the nutrient balance. And as we talked about in the case of water pollution, if you end up with excess nitrogen in your water supply, it actually adds nutrients that allow, that, that imbalance your biological systems. 
um, and cause for blooms in algal growth, et cetera, um, for example. Okay, we can reduce nitrogen oxides. Uh, it's pretty standard. There are catalytic converters that are on your car and things like that. We can actually uh, make sure that when we're combusting things, we actually provide enough extra heat or energy to combust things completely and remove all the energy. And in doing so, that will generally result in uh, better results as far as um, the, how the pollution is distributed. Notice, for example, in this picture here, you have uh, particular compounds that are not completely combusted, but if we provide extra heat and some catalysts, what we can actually do is result in output that is more benign. Particulate matter basically stands for anything that's sort of solid pieces, and usually the way we classify particulate matter is based on size. You can see here we have a range of sizes, all these sizes being in microns, which is micrometers or 10 to the negative 6 meters, okay? Um, and they can reduce in size, and the smaller they are, the further they go down into your lungs and throat. Again, our biology is designed to capture some particles, but the smaller they are, the more likely it is that they're going to get end up further and further into the lungs and end up into the small air sacs or the bronchi in your, uh, in your lungs. If they end up there, your body can process them, but they can often cause irritation um, and blockage, um, particularly in people who already have some sort of problems, biological problems with their lungs and or their other pulmonary capacity. So, how can we reduce particulate matter? Well, there are practices that we can do when we're dealing with agriculture and construction. Notice usually when we're digging into the soil, we're going to tend to stir up things. Well, if you can do that digging while wetting things down, um, or you can use certain practices that don't sort of stir things up, you can use certain crops that prevent fields from being sort of bare. Similarly, when you're doing construction, you can do things that sort of cover up and prevent direct exposure of open soil to the air, and that can sort of uh, reduce your particulate matter. We can also further tr treat combustion exhaust, okay, and control the sources of different things to reduce the particular matter that's in the air. Uh, in particular, things like their regulations on burning trash and on the technology behind wood burning stoves, that if you buy a particular stove, there are ways that you can go about um, making sure that you burn it correctly. Um, and therefore reduce some of the particulate matter that comes out. And when you think about smoke, smoke is actually where we can visualize particulate matter. When you see the sort of gray or black or white sort of haze that comes out, it's a combination sometimes of steam, but also basically a high density of particulate matter is actually visible as smoke. Mercury is another pollutant that sort of gets mixed in, part of burning processes okay, in emissions, um, and then mercury sort of ends up in our various systems. And mercury it by itself is actually, again, it, it's a type of poison that, um, or a, a toxic substance that accumulates over time. So large amounts of mercury can sort of accumulate into biological systems. Lead, again, being another, um, another chemical that's considered uh, in air quality um, something that we measure that's definitely been attributed to health problems, particularly in the development of younger children, uh, infants and younger children. And then a, another one in our list is something called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. Basically, these are groups of compounds that are primarily carbon-based, and volatile means that they tend to evaporate at low I mean, uh, at relatively low temperatures. So in sort of our standard normal temperatures, they evaporate. Things like gasoline, for example, you know that as soon as you spill gasoline, you'll immediately smell it and it'll evaporate very quickly. That's an example of something like a volatile organic compound. Okay, we have many, many uh, ways that we produce these, but again, primarily, they're from the combustion of fuel and then our industrial and vehicle processes. So, one of the things we do, one of our purposes of sort of um, is we have the EPA and other groups monitor um, the presence of these different contaminants. And you'll notice there is a series here, six different categories, but include particulate matter, that's the PM here, okay, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, 
and nitrogen oxide. Um, nitrous, I'm forgetting which NO2 is. Um, but we have a series of those that are sort of, that we measure and keep track of the different pollutant concentrations. And each of those concentrations, if they reach a particular value, they contribute to what's called an air quality index. They give a score depending on how much there is of one or another. For example, you might have a certain amount of particulate matter of a certain size over 24 hours, but you might have a lower amount of carbon monoxide, et cetera. So you'll have some different amounts. Each of those contribute to the air quality index, which is a score from zero up to as high as 500. But notice once you get above 200, you get to a place where you're considered very unhealthy. And this index is mostly meant to help communicate to the general public um, recommendations about behavior for how they should behave if they want to sort of maintain their health or to, be, to, to best behave when the air quality is very poor. Very often you might just ignore the air quality, but you'll notice on certain days um, that you might see some information about the air quality being poor or in one of these sort of categories. They use colors to sort of represent that a green color represents, hey, not a bad day if you can do normal activities whereas you get to the red or the purple color, it generally indicates that the air quality is unhealthy for breathing. So how you monitor, sort of monitor your, um, your behavior then is to you kind of consider what happens depending on what risk you're at. If you're already suffering from some sort of reduced uh, breathing capacity, then you might need to, on very even relatively low risk day, well, moderate risk days, you might consider not planning on going for a run or doing something that might require you to breathe at a high rate and therefore um, bring in more pollutant than you would normally. Notice once you get to the very high risk level, um, then everybody is sort of recommended to maybe reduce the amount of activity that they do. And this air quality index is something that we use pretty regularly um, that is sort of maintained. The EPA will report on it, and you can even consider it as sort of a weather map. So you can look and, and see and find that information from day to day, particularly when you know um, in North Carolina, for example, on very, very hot days, they will often have um, poor air quality, and there'll be some indications of that. Other cities are known for having particularly poor air quality. Beijing is one of them, which is currently growing, going through a particular amount of growth um, and a, a, a large amount of industry that leads to high and poor air quality. So those are some of the pieces of um, the, the pieces, the different pollutants that we consider as part of our air quality and a little bit of a discussion about what it means to have poor air quality and air pollution.